Who hey, likes Skittles? Who, who likes Skittles? Whose favorite candy is Skittles? Anybody? Oh, Rachel, uh, uh, Megan, I mean, put her hand up. So here you go, Megan. Uh, some Skittles for you. And that's a big bag right there. I tell you, that's that's the grand prize. Anybody else like Skittles? Yeah. I, I, I thought so. Uh, you know. I thought that would probably be what would happen. We, we got all kinds. Everybody, everybody take take one there and let's see. We got all kinds of different varieties here. There you go. Here's one for you. Every, I tell you what, just just take that, pass it back there. Everybody get you some Skittles, okay? And uh, what, what we're going to do with the Skittles is um, obviously you, you can have some and, and kind of munch on them, I guess, for the next little bit. But they've got a purpose today, okay? Hopefully you'll see that eventually. But but feel free, like I said, to indulge yourselves a little bit and just take one, pass, pass it around, you know. Um, there's a few different sizes in there, so uh, we'll see who the greedy ones are, I guess. But uh, maybe I already have. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, by the time it gets over here, you guys may just have to look back. Sorry about that. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but, you know, feel, feel free to share, right? I mean, I mean, we share, don't we? So... Uh, but today we're talking about being fully engaged uh, in, in my church. Last week we talked about being fully engaged in what? Do y'all remember? What did we talk about last week? I heard somebody whisper it. Full, fully engaged in our walk with God. That's what we talked about last week. Today we're going to talk about being fully engaged with our church, okay? And so, uh, or in my church. And so... It's important, I think, for us to understand uh, the importance of the local church. A lot of people uh, discount uh, the importance of a local body of believers known as the church. and They say, hey, they can have a relationship with God without the church, and, and that's fine. But I love what Johnny Hunt, the pastor at First Baptist Woodstock, always says. He says, you know, you can be a Christian and not go to church, but if you want to be a good Christian, <laughs> you, you have to go to church, okay? So, yeah, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a huge difference because... Uh, you know, we need one another, and the key is, if you're fully engaged with God, you're going to be fully engaged with your church, okay? I mean, that's just the way it is, and so in order to be fully engaged with God, it's, it goes with it, because God created us to do life together, to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable, those types of things, and so uh, that's what we're going to talk about uh, today, being fully engaged in our church, so or in my church. And so does anybody remember our key verse? Uh, Second Chronicles 16.9 for our series. Anybody remember, how many of y'all memorized that this week? Anybody remember that? Let's go on. Let's, let's say it together, okay? Second Chronicles 16.9. This is the Makos translation, of course. You can go back and look at it in different translations, but we're pretty on spot here. The eyes of the Lord, say it with me. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully engaged with Him. That's good stuff, isn't it? You know, God's looking for people to strengthen whose hearts are fully engaged with Him. God wants us to be fully engaged with Him, don't He? And that's what we looked at last week. And last week we gave you a little bit of, of a survey. It's called the Ten Measurements of Engagement. The Ten Pillars of a Fully Engaged Walk with God. If you didn't get this, then uh, you can pick up one of these on the way out. We'll make sure you get a copy, but... You can also, uh, all of our messages we try to put on YouTube, and they're on my personal YouTube page, and so you can go to the church website, and you can link them there, so if you miss a Sunday, you can go back and watch it, okay? And it's not high quality, but it, it works. You have to turn the volume all the way up, uh, but, but that's one of the reasons we turn the microphone up louder on me so that it picks up a little better, but, but uh, if you missed that, you, might, you can go back and watch that, kind of get caught back up this week on what we were talking about, but... And uh, you can pick up one of these little surveys. But what I did was uh, last week we had you do one of these little surveys and then you put together a little score and, and we encouraged you to take at least one action step to try to uh, fix some of those areas, maybe that you're not engaged with God as much as you should be. And so, and so we asked the question, how can we really tell if we're really engaged? How can we really tell? Did everybody get some Skittles? Everybody, everybody, everybody got served, right? All right. And, and I'm sure there's some left over for the kids, so we'll take care of them later, right? When we're ready to go home. Uh, so, but, uh, yeah, I got more over there. Okay, so, yeah, I, okay. So, wow, okay, somebody stopped up back there. Oh, everybody didn't get some? Everybody said they did. Okay, okay well, if I didn't here, I'll let you take care of it. There should be some in there. So. All right, so, 
But anyway, we, so how can we tell? You know, you're here this morning. Most of us, you know, if you're coming to church, you want to be engaged with God, don't you? You want, you want a deeper walk with Him. That's what you're searching for, and that's why you're here. So how can we do that? And so if we're going to figure out how we can do it, we have to know what it looks like. And so what does the fruit of a fully engaged life look like? What, what does that look like? And, and you know, how, how can you know if you're living out your faith? Well, Gallup, uh, you know, they're these big survey people. They did this huge poll, and, and, and they, they do, do polls all the time. And, and they asked a survey of thousands of people across the country, and, and they said, what are the actions of an engaged life? And, and they found out that the engaged life has, has five fruits. And so we passed out these little sheets for you guys, and this is your, kind of your notes for this week. And, and you can, uh, can kind of look at that and kind of see what they are. Uh, the the five um, the five what what I call them on there I've kind of lost my place actions the five actions or the five fruits I guess is what I was looking at spiritual commitment life satisfaction serving inviting and giving those are kind of the those are the things that Gallup kind of showed and so we've translated that a little bit more you know to to go along with our message today so our goal obviously here at the Fellowship Church you know is we want to help you become a fully developed follower of Christ. You know, somebody who's a, a disciple, who's making disciples that make disciples. To me, that, that, that's what we see in Scripture. Somebody that's really walking with God is somebody who's, who's not just going to church, but they're a disciple maker. They're somebody who loves God and loves people, and they want to lead other people to faith in Christ. And so you become this, this machine that makes disciples that make disciples. So you don't just make disciples to make them. You make disciples that will make disciples. And that's, that's what we're trying to, to engage people with here and try to create. That's who we want to be and that's who we want you guys to be. And so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at when we're talking about being engaged. And so I hope all of you today will be able to walk out of here with a, a more of an action plan of how you can develop these fruits in your lives. Okay? And so that's our goal today. So let's look at these five actions of a fully engaged life. Number one, number one, I take responsibility daily for my spiritual growth. And so out to the side of your little papers, uh, there's, there's a little check box. And so after we go over this, at some point, I want you to decide, do I do this or do I not? You know, you either check it off, yes or no. Or maybe there's a maybe, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'll let y'all decide. But y'all, maybe you can grade yourself like you did last week, one to ten. Uh, and, you know, on where you stand. I'll, I'll let you guys, but I take responsible, uh, I take responsibility daily for my spiritual growth. And so the key words here are take responsibility. Take responsibility. And you know, what, what, these are two very important words. And so turn to your neighbor right now and tell them to take responsibility for their spiritual growth. Tell them. Responsibility. Take responsibility for your spiritual growth. That's right. You see, because what happens is when you're a brand new Christian, it's a lot like being a baby. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, the phrase being born again, and the scripture teaches us that we're babes in Christ. We're born again. We start a new life. And, and a lot of times, if we've not, especially if we've not grown up in church and we don't know a whole lot of truth of scripture, we're exactly like a baby when it comes to spiritual faith. And, and so, it, 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 you know, and what babies need someone to help them grow, don't they? Babies can't survive on their own. We know that. They need help. And so, but there comes a point after a baby grows uh, that, uh, you know, there always comes a point where the parents are no longer responsible for helping them to grow, right? I mean, they, they eventually come to that point where they can grow on their own, hopefully. And, and so now all of our children, you know, have required care from us, obviously. And they, all of them have needed everything from us at some point in time. Food, bathing, clothing, changing diapers, you know, the complete care. Y'all know how it goes. And, uh, you know, as they've gotten older, they've encountered milestones, you know, where they gain more and more independence. Now, I mean, who doesn't rejoice, you know, when, uh, when their children can wipe their own bottoms, huh? You, how many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, okay. That's right. <laughs> so, for the most part now, you know, all of our children can feed themselves and clean their own bottoms. So, obviously, Levi still needs some help doing a lot of things. But even he does a lot of stuff on his own. He don't need us for everything. And... And, uh, you know, he, he develops his own growth. He's, the iPad teaches him just about everything he needs to know, I think. But, but at some point, we expect our children to move out of our homes and pursue life on their own without much help from us at all, right? <laughs> 
some of us can't wait for that point, right? I mean, they get to a certain point. Of, but look, so what you get a lot of times is, is when you've got a 40-year-old still living at home, depending on parents to thrive, there's a problem somewhere, right? I mean, I mean, you know, I can understand when you go through a difficult time, and maybe there's a, a little bit of time for healing and those type of things, but, 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 you know, a 40-year-old should be on their own. They don't, they shouldn't need that care like a baby needs, is what I'm saying. And so, I mean, it's cute, and it's fun to feed an infant, isn't it? I mean, you put them in the high chair, and you, you know, you, you do the little choo-choo train and open up the tunnel or the airplane or whatever. And I mean, it's fun. And, you know, they drool all over themselves and you just make a fuss over it, you know. And I mean, everybody has a good time doing that. But when they're 35 <laughs> and they're still sitting in the high chair and, and, you're, and, and, they're, and they're saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, that's not cool, you know. And it's not fun, is it? I mean, it's just, you get over it pretty quick. And, uh, you know, that somewhere along the way, you've got to learn to take responsibility. And so look in your Christian life. And if you've been a Christian for more than a year, you know, you should have started taking some responsibility on it. You know, usually by, by a year old, most, most babies, they start walking on their own, you know, and, and they do a lot of feeding of themselves. There's a lot of stuff that happens between that first year and an infant's life that they pick up and they can do without you. And it should be the same for us spiritually. A year, uh, you know, can make a huge difference in, in someone's life. And, and so, you know, here's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, I shouldn't have to call you and encourage you to come to, to worship on Sunday morning. You know, the pastor shouldn't have to beg you to come to church. If you're uh, taking responsibility, you make a commitment to be at worship. You know, and 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 to to you know that's that's one of the easiest things to do. And I shouldn't have to remind you to you know you should be a part of a small group. But you know, we're not just doing these little connect fellowships for fun. Those those I think are necessary for us really to to grow together and to grow deeper, to go deeper in the Word. Because on Sunday mornings, we can only go so deep in here with everybody here. But in a small group, we can answer deep questions and we can talk about personal things. And, and, and so that's the reason I think it's important for us to all have those, uh, we call them Connect Fellowships, those small groups. And they're important parts. And you know, I shouldn't have to call and say, hey, are, are, are you stepping it up? Are you ready to take it to the next level? You know, it's time for you to get out of the high chair and start taking some responsibility on your own. And, you know, and so it's not really a high chair for a lot of Christians. It's an eye chair, isn't it? I mean, we, we get so self-focused, and, and that's the reason a lot of people, now they look for, they go, and they go from church to church to church to see what that church can give them, to see what that church can give them. But, but you know, when we become a part of the church, it's not about what the church can give me. It's about what God can do through me with that church. How can I be a part of that church to reach the world with that church for God's glory. And so, yeah. so that, that's what we're talking about between a, a spiritual infant and one who's growing because, you know, we see those differences. And so it's about taking responsibility. And that first step uh, uh, is a, a spiritual engagement. Let's look at James 4.8. We talked about this verse last week. James 4.8 says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So how do you start? If you're going to be fully engaged, if you're going to take some responsibility, what do you have to do? You have to draw close to God. Draw close to God. That's how you start by taking responsibility. Draw close to God. Instead of, of and if you draw close to God, the Bible says that He will come close to you. And so instead of living in divided life, divided between God and the world, you know, the farther you get away from God, the more stuff gets in between you and God. And, and so if you want to get you want to get stuff out of the way between you and God, you've got to get closer. And so th th I think this is exactly what J uh, James is saying here. And so, you know, if, if, if instead of, if you've got to start living life focused and start experiencing the power of a fully engaged life. And if you want to do that, you've got to take responsibility to get close to God. And listen to me, every one of you, and me, all of us included, you are as close to God right now as you've chosen to be. You're as close to God right now as you've chosen to be. Because we saw last week that God is fully engaged with us, isn't He? He's there. He's waiting on us. And the only thing keeping us from being fully engaged with Him is us. 
And so we're as fully engaged with God as we've chosen to be. And so if you want to be fully engaged with God, you've got to decide to be closer to God and you've got to take responsibility for that. And so every day you just got to say, okay, God, today I'm taking responsibility for my spiritual growth. I'm drawing close to you. And what you'll find is when you do that, God will draw closer to you. You will feel His power in your life. You, you know, I, If you've been a Christian very long and you've practiced uh, having a prayer time and time in the Word and drawing close to God in the morning, and you felt the power of God in your life when you do that, and then you've not, and then you have days and weeks when you don't do that, then you know the difference, and you know what I'm talking about. And so, if you've never done that, you're missing out. Uh, start your day off by drawing close to God and feel the power of God come in your heart and life, and see how He changes your day, see how He changes your perspective, and see how He uses you. That's that He will give you His power. He will give you His purpose for your life. And so, how are you doing on this? One? Are you taking responsibility? Are you, are you, have you taken this step? Are you taking responsibility? Can, can you put a check by it? You know? And if not, then I hope you'll decide to make it a priority today. So that's number one. I take responsibility daily for my spiritual growth. Now number two, the second action of an engaged life, or the second fruit, is this. I practice contentment in all areas of my life. Now this is one that's, I'll just go ahead and admit it, I'll throw it out to you, this is one of the most difficult ones for me. I shared with you what, was, what my weakest one was last week, I'll share it with you again this week. I practice contentment in all areas of my life. I, I'm hard to satisfy anybody. She's not even going to respond. Uh, but you know, I, 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 but anyway, I practice contentment. So what we're really asking is, are you satisfied with your life? Are you satisfied? Can you be satisfied? Uh, several years ago, um, I'm thinking it was Anne Graham Lotz. Uh, she she wrote this book. She had this series. You know, she's a, a women's teacher, preacher, and uh, she uh, taught uh, this. She says, "Just get, just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus." That's what she said. And I always think about that. You know, uh, just give me Jesus, because as as fully engaged followers of Christ, we ought to be satisfied just with Jesus. If that's all we got, we ought to be satisfied. We ought to be able to be content in that. So it's a big question. And, you know, they ask this question a lot. Gallup does in America and a lot of their polls. You know, how, how, are, how satisfied are Americans? Are you satisfied? And you know what? Americans are never satisfied. And I, I guess that's why that I'm not because I am one. <laughs> but, but we're discontent people. I mean, you know, and... and and, and maybe it's okay if you're talking about climbing the corporate ladder, or you know, if you envision, if you, envi you envision a better world, you know, and, and and that's part that part's okay when you can see something, and you you know, if God's given that to you, then that's okay not to be satisfied the way things are because we know God wants to make things better. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being content with where you are, where God's placed you to live and work, and who God's made you to be you got to have some contentment in that. And, um, and so that, that's a big one. And so, uh, because con discontentment is actually one of those things that will keep you from drawing close to God. When you're discontent with your life, and you're discontent with your job, and when you're discontent with your relationships, you know, those things will keep you from having a close relationship with God. And so, if I could ask you how content you are right now, how, how, how would you rate yourself? Why don't you think about that? On a scale from 1 to 100, how content are you right now? How would you rate your satisfaction in your marriage or your relationships, whatever that might be? What about with your job? Where, where, where would you put yourself with your career? What about where you live, the, the, the house, the, the environment, those kind of things? How are you doing in those areas? You know, the, those are good questions to ask. Are you content to be where God has placed you? Because, because discontentment comes when we can't enjoy the now. See, contentment's about enjoying the now. You know, it, it's okay to envision something better and to fight for something better, but how about just being content with where God has placed you, who God has made you? That's what we're talking about. Because a lot of times we get so stuck in the past or we're too focused on the future, just be content with where we are right now where God's trying to use us. And so when we're discontent, we separate ourselves from God and we can't be all that God wants us to be. And so... I want to share with you uh, a little bit about some of my discontentment. Uh, last year, uh, it's been, I guess, close to a year and a half now, and we moved back. 
uh, to Sweetwater. We stayed with my parents. I was a 40-something year old living in my parents, all right, for a little while. But we, it was just a, just a temporary thing But but uh, until we could close on our house. But, I, you know, but I was a basket case of emotions. And I, I still am anyway a lot. But, but uh, you know, we've been through a lot in the last uh, year or so. And, and uh, I was excited about what the future might hold as God used us to transform lives in my hometown. We knew that God had called us to plant this church. There was a lot of concern, too, and some fear. One of my biggest worries was I didn't want, I didn't want to come in here. I was worried about what my pastor friends and some of the other churches uh, thought about us, and I didn't want to, want to be, become that person who split churches and draw, drew people away from all the other churches. That's the reason we came in and you started small and, and we're trying to build up because we're trying to build a church not by splitting churches and bringing people from other churches but by bringing people out of their homes that are not going to churches to be a part of who we are okay and so I was just really nervous about a lot of that and and uh, you know I didn't want to hurt people that I love deeply you know in this area and, and I definitely didn't want to split churches but but the biggest concern I had and I guess the fuel for my discontentment was I'd spent, you know, several years in full-time ministry, and uh, I had to go back to work in a secular job, and uh, oh, I hated that. You know, I just did, and and it's not that I don't like the type of work that I do in in a secular environment. I actually enjoy it a little bit, but it's not my passion. You know, it's not what I want to be doing all the time, and um, you know, and so. And I, I got up to go to work, and I, I would just be completely discontent. I just, you know, and I would get mad at different. I'd get angry because of, you know, the influences, kind of some of the things that happened, and, and I kind of living in the past and living, you know, and trying to envision the, wanting, wanting the future. You know, I wanted the fellowship church to be banned two or three hundred so I could be a full time pastor again. You know, and I missed that. You know, and, and so. So I was kind of disgruntled because things wasn't like it used to be and it wasn't where it, I wanted it to be in the future and I just wasn't content. And I, boy, I was really struggling with it a lot. And, and um, you know, even though, you know, when I went to work and when I went to work, you know, when I was hired, the people there, my, my managers, the people that hired me, they knew that I was a pastor. I told them I was going to be a pastor in the workplace and I've seen God use me in the workplace. And what we do is we make medical bandages and devices and some of the stuff we make save lives. I mean, that's exciting, you know, that some of the stuff we do. And so it's a lot better than some jobs, but, but even though I was thankful to have the job to provide for my family, and even though I let my coworkers and managers know all this stuff, I just wasn't content. And I'd say, even today, I'm not completely satisfied with it because I'd, I'd rather be spending more time in Sweetwater ministering people, but, but my focus was off. You know, my focus was off. I, I would dwell too much on what was or what could be to stay too to stay focused on what is right now, where God's put me. I'd just be content with that. And I become discontent when I when I focus on everything that's wrong instead of focus on, on everything that's right. And it, has that happened to you? And, and and that's one of the biggest things. I I, I fell. I become discontent when I fail to to see the opportunities that God gives me to do His work wherever I am. And, and so if I'm open and I'm, I'm walking with God and I'm engaged with God and I see those opportunities, then it brings a lot more peace. It brings a lot more content. And so that's what I'm trying to tell you guys. And so uh, I was focused on the past. But finally I began to focus more on the now instead of, instead of focusing on those other things. And I'm, I'm a lot more content now. I still struggle with some, so y'all pray with me. Uh, but, but, you know, many folks aren't able to enjoy contentment in the now. You know, because they're so stuck in the past. Some are so focused on looking forward that they can't enjoy now. They can't be satisfied with now. You know, people think, well, I plan to move somewhere else in a couple of years, or as soon as I finish this, or I'm going to get there, or when I get this promotion, then, you know, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or, you know, I, and, and, and they leave God out of everything, it seems like, you know, because they're always putting it off, you know, I'm always putting off a relationship with God. I'm going to do this. I can't enjoy now. Or, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow my wild oats, and then I'm going to get married, and then I'm going to get things right with God. Or, or I'll start coming to church as soon as I, I, I don't have to work on Sundays anymore. And I mean, all the, you know, there's always something. But I'll just say this. Practice content. Be satisfied with Jesus. Apostle Paul learned about this, and in Philippians chapter 2, 
I mean, excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, he wrote about this. He, he wrote about the secret to contentment. You want to put that, that one up there for us? Uh, and if you want to look at this passage, look, look what he says. He says, I know what it is to be in need. Now, he was in prison when he wrote this. Paul said, I know what, what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He was a Pharisee, and one of the top Pharisees, so he knew what it was like probably to have some money and some prestige. So he, now he's in prison, so he knows both ends of the story. And he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Okay? So this is what Paul says. He says, I know, I know the secret. And, and a little over a year ago, I preached this message. I think it was at Glenlock. And so if you go to the, my YouTube channel, as I talked about earlier, you can, you can see a whole message on the, these verses around this text. But, but the, the message that I preached is called The Secret to Satisfaction. The secret is just give me Jesus. Be satisfied with Jesus. He's all we need. He's all we need. Notice the phrase. He says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Have you learned that secret yet? Can you check off that box because you've learned that secret? I have learned to be content in every situation. Have you learned that? Practice contentment and saying, God, you placed me here and this is going to be the place where I am engaged with you. I'm not going to focus on my past and I'm not going to let the fact that I'm open for something different or something for the future, I'm not going to let that rob me of my contentment today. I'm going to live for you just today. Can you do that? Just be content just today. Be content today. Because this is where we live. This is the moment that God has made for us to live in. And I'm going to practice contentment today. That's the action of an engaged life. So, so uh, that's number two. Number three, I serve one hour a week in my church. I will serve one hour per week in my church. So you want to be engaged? Now we're getting practical, aren't we? Now I'm meddling, ain't I? I, I? You know, I know. But this is more of application. You know, this is, this is a fully committed follower of Jesus. So we're moving from taking responsibility and contentment to something real and practical. So we've been talking about doing stuff. So now, while we're talking about serving one hour a week in your church, we're talking about volunteering one, at least one hour a week. I want to put at least, but, but you know, because most, most of us, if we're really fully engaged, we're going to spend more than an hour, aren't we? But, but at least an hour. Let's start. We've got to start somewhere. Let's start with an hour, right? And so serving is the path to engagement. Because when you're involved in something and you're engaged with something, so you want to be more involved in your church, you want to be more involved with your relationship with God, start serving. Because God's a servant, isn't He? Jesus served. And so if you want to be involved with Him, you're going to have to be a servant. You're going to have to serve. Serving others is the path to greatness. Look at what Jesus said in John 12, 26. He said, Anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me because my servants must be where I am. You see, the word, what word did Jesus use to describe his followers? Servants. Servants. Those who follow Jesus are servants. And he said, my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. So, so how do you serve Jesus in our day? How do you serve Jesus today? How do you do it? I think you do it through your church. Because the church is that institution, that, that body, it's the body of Christ. It's the institution that God has, has uh, put His blessing upon and His promise upon the, that the church will prevail. The, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church uh, is going to be here, you know, until Jesus comes again. And, and the church is who God gave us the, uh, gave the great commission to, to carry out. So how do you serve? You serve God. You serve Jesus by serving through the church. And so how can you do that at the Fellowship Church? Well, we've talked about this so much. And some of you guys have started doing it. Hey, uh, I'm... Uh, Y'all are doing great. I love you. And so... But how can you do it? come early on Sunday mornings? You know, instead of getting here at 11.27, get here at 10.27, okay? Come an hour early. You know, there's always stuff to do. You know, we're sending people to Walmart to buy food and Skittles and, 
and uh, you know we got a vacuum spots and somebody spills something so we're cleaning that up and and you know we're straightening the chairs out and we've got people in the parking lot we're trying to wave people in and you know there's always stuff to do we need people to run the soundboard and the powerpoint and the camera and to be security stand by the door you know we you know they're on and on there's always stuff to do and 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 you don't have to be asked just step up and start serving you know grab some of those things that you can do and just do them you know if you don't know what to do then just let one of us know and we'll help you figure it out you know you can you can help visitors with their cards and help them find a place to sit. You can serve by helping with Awana that we started last week, by becoming a member of the praise team. Uh, you know, all these things. And look, here's something else you can do. Don't everybody have a heart attack on me. You can host a Connect Fellowship in your home and invite family and friends to come over for a Bible study. Okay? And, and, and tell them about Jesus. And, and I'm saying no matter what you're doing during the week, no matter how busy you are, make time to serve. And we can also use the people to help follow up on our prospects, can't we, bitch? You know, and that's going and knocking on doors or making some phone calls or sending out some letters. And if you can do that, you know, you can serve. We need people to do all these things. And so serving at least one hour per week in your church is an easy, practical way <coughs> to get fully engaged. And so... Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11, He says, The greatest among you must be a servant. And so if you want to be great, you've got to sign up to serve. Okay? You've got to sign up to serve. And so how are you doing in that area? Can you check that one off? Are you, are you serving at least an hour a week in the church? Okay? Now, number four, we're going to try to move on. We've got two more I want to share with you. Num number four, I invite one friend a month to church with me. Hey, I know a lot of y'all have been inviting people, and I, 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 that's awesome. Keep it up, and you know, uh, keep that up. And you know, here's what we're talking about: sharing the good news with people, inviting our friends to hear the gospel, inviting them to become a part. You know, and this is what I always say, and y'all can say it too. When we invite you to the fellowship, we're not inviting you to church; we're inviting you to be a, be a part of a family. Yep. Okay, that's what we're doing. We want you to be a part of our family, and so, um, and so. Every one of us here are here today because at some point and sometime somebody invited us to church. And all of us are here at some point in time because somebody invited us to the fellowship. God invited me. He, he, he started it in my heart, right? And so, but from that point on, every one of us are here as a result of somebody else telling them about the fellowship church. And so and nobody else is going to come unless they know. And that's our responsibility to invite them. And so, but this is a good standard engagement. Really, it should be more than once a month. More than one person a month. But hey, like I said, it's a good place to start. If you're not doing it now, if you're doing more than one a month, please don't stop. Okay? Keep doing more. Add to. Don't take away from. But if you're not being inviting anybody, I want you to start out inviting one person a month. You know, And we'll, we'll challenge you that way. And it doesn't mean every time you invite somebody, they say yes, because they don't. You know, they'll give you all kinds of excuses, but... One of the ways you can invite people is by using these fellowship cards. Now, I've got business cards, so I don't use these, but these are for you guys. And, and it's just the Fellowship Church, uh, and um, <clears throat> it's um, you can put your name and contact information, or you can put the website on the back, and, and just hand it to people. And this is what I do. A lot of times, it, it, I'll just drive through a drive-thru, and I do it all the time if I'm eating in two. And I drive through the drive-thru, and when I, when, you know, if they got two windows, I try to do both of them. And when I take my money, I say, hey, I'm... I hand this with my debit card, and I say, hey, I'm the pastor of a new church in town called the Fellowship Church. We'd love for you to check us out. And I just hand them the card, okay? And, when they, and I'll do the same thing, you know, and I, I do, it, do it all the time. And so what I want you guys to do is take it. We've got a bunch of these, and we can get more, okay? If you take, uh, well, I, 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 wanna, I, I said once, once a month, so maybe you get four of them, okay? You get four of them every month, and every week you give one out. Okay? And then at the end of the month, you come back and you reload. Okay, and, and I'm just telling you, just grab some of them. And you know, if you keep up with them, you put them in a certain place, maybe in your car, in your pocketbook, or in your wallet, or whatever. You see how many you got left, and you know these. You got you got four left, and and there's four days left in the month. <laughs> you got a lot of making up to do, right? And so, but that's that's what we want to encourage you to do. And you know, and I know some of you struggle with this a little bit, invite people to church, but. And, you know, you say, I'm not really good at it, but I want to I challenge you. Just get out of your comfort zone. 
You know, get out of your comfort zone. And it's only when you get outside of your comfort zone. God wants us to get outside our comfort zone. He's going to ask us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. And, and you grow when you get outside your comfort zone. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, your muscles don't grow when you're working out. Your muscles don't grow when you're working out unless you lift something heavier than you can lift, really. If you're just lifting that easy stuff, you know, you're, you're just fooling yourself. You're not doing any good. You got to put some weight on there and let some muscles start tearing a little bit, get you outside of your comfort zone before you start building it up. And it's the same way in our spiritual walk. We got to, we got to get outside our comfort zone and let God help grow us, okay? And so, why don't you think of people that you can invite? And you know, if you hadn't invited anybody all year, I want you to I want you to uh, maybe set a goal for uh, make it your goal to invite ten people in October, and you can get caught up. Okay, invite ten people in October, you get caught up, and then, then you got November, December, you you know go back to one, I guess. But 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 you know, let's get caught up. Let, let's really do this. And so, here's a passage for you to meditate on over the next couple of weeks. As you uh, as you take this step, as you talk about uh, inviting people to church, look, write this one down. Read it every day. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so, who could you invite? You know, make it your go to invite one person a month to come with you. Meditate on this verse, and everything you need to know is right here in this verse. Look at look at some of these things. You know, and when you're doing that, invite at least one person each month, and, and then if you practice contentment. You're taking responsibility for your own spiritual growth. And, and then there's one more action you can take, okay? And that's this. I bring the full tithe to God each week. So how you doing? We're, we're checking them off. And now we're, we're going to talk about the tithe. And, and, you know, I hate talking about money as much as y'all hate listening to somebody talking about money. But look, this is, this is serious. The Bible says what you do with your money is one of the greatest signs of your engagement with God. If you never... If you never use your money to bring people into God's kingdom, then you're just fooling yourself if you think you're fully engaged with God. It's because a heart that's fully engaged with God uses their uh, a person uh, whose hearts are is fully engaged with God. That they they use their resources to build God's kingdom, and 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 they they they're glad. You know, I always tell people, hey, if we have to pry a penny. Uh, from your fingers with a crowbar to get you to give, then just hang on to it, okay? Uh, because a person who loves God wants to give. And they want to give what already belongs to God. And so, uh, you know, that's that's why I want you to get this terminology. A tithe in the Old Testament is a tenth, okay? It's a tenth. That's what it means. It's the word for tenth. And so, uh, God asked uh, His people to give a tenth, the first fruits, a tenth of everything that they brought in back to Him as offerings. And so, that, that's what a tithe is. And so, are you giving a tenth to God each week? And so, we're going to talk about how to do that. But a couple of weeks ago at the Sweetwater football game, I bought the boys a bag of Skittles. And uh, when I asked one of them to let me have a few, his response was, no. Okay? Now, let me explain something to you. I've got five children, four nephews, and one niece. And that's not the first time something like this has happened. Okay? <laughs> And I'm sure it's not going to be the last. But the problem is this. It's warped perception of ownership. Okay? Children have a warped perception of ownership. Write that down. Okay? Uh, there's three problems with it that I see. Okay? Number one is this. They too often forget why they have what they have in the first place. You understand what I'm talking about? They forget why they have what they have in the first place. So I reminded him that I'm the one who bought the Skittles. And I gave them to him. And I said, you wouldn't even have those if I hadn't bought them for you. You know? And so, a, a warped perception of why they have what they have. Okay? Number two, children too quickly forget the super strength of their adult counterparts. <laughs> All right? uh, you see, my boys are, are super tiny. I mean, they're little for five-year-olds. You know? I mean, and so, I could have easily just 
grabbed the candy, <laughs> taken it away, and eat the whole bag in one bite. I mean, you know. Uh, and, and they probably would have never had Skittles ever again. And, uh, and so number three is they often underestimate the desire of their parents to give to them. They underestimate the desire of the parents to give to them. And, and so, you see, if I wanted to, I could have gone back to the concession stand and I could have bought every bag of Skittles that they had. And I could have uh, brought those back and dumped a whole rainbow of fruit flavor on their heads. You know? I mean, I could have. And so, you know, their perception, they don't understand that, you know. And so, and hopefully you, you see the picture here. You know, Skittles in many ways represents the financial blessings that every one of us enjoy. Some of you today have a big bag of Skittles. Some of you have a really big bag of Skittles. Some of you have little bitty bags of Skittles. And some of you have eaten your Skittles and now they're all gone and you have no more Skittles. <laughs> But 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 we've all we all have some skittles, don't we? Except for JJ who come in late, he, he messed out. But but uh, but uh, God looks at us and he says he says, look, if you want your heart to be with me, if you want your engagement with me, uh, you know, if you want your engagement with me to go up and you want to grow, if you want me to bless your life, give me some of your skittles. Give me some of your skittles. You know, right? Obviously, we're not talking about skittles here now, right? But when we cross our arms and say no. And God says, hey, I'm just asking for 10%. I'm not asking for everything. And we still say no. Then it's clear that we misunderstand three things about God. Number one, we forget that we could not have anything that God hadn't given it to us. Number two, we also forget that if God wanted to, He could take it all away. Possessions, health, life, gone. And number three, we also underestimate that God can give us so much more than we can ever imagine. He has that ability. And His desire is to bless us. And He could pour out upon us so much more. And so, in fact, God tells us in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, He says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Notice the first word. Bring. Bring. Would You, you can circle that word bring in your Bible or make a note of it. Everything you have, God gave you. And so when you tithe, you are bringing something back to God that He already gave you in the first place. Okay? You're not giving God anything. You're just bringing back to Him something He's already given you. Just a piece of what He's already given you. And so, you're giving a portion back. So, you bring your tithe to the church. And so, you make sure that it goes where God wants it to go. So, you bring the whole tithe. And that's 10% of the first part of what you earn. And so, I always say 10% of what you earn, that's the gross. That's 10% of the gross. You bring that to God and you give that back to God because everything you have, and it goes into the storehouse. He said, it says it goes into the storehouse, and that's Old Testament language, and that's what we would call in the modern day, that's what we would call the church because God's instrument to bless the nations in the Old Testament was Israel, and, and the, the sacrificial system displayed His glory and His, and His means of bringing us salvation. I mean, in the New Testament, that's the church. Because Christ died and He gave His life for the church and God established the church to bring redemption to all mankind through the proclamation of the gospel, through us going out and loving people and giving them the good news. And how do we do that? And to do that, it takes some money. And it takes resources. And so that's why God says you bring that first 10% back to the local church. And you know, I don't know why God set it up that way. He could have said, bring me 50%. And then 10% wouldn't seem so bad. You know? I, I would love it if our government only asked for 10%. Amen? You know, but they want more. Uh, but, but, 
you know, he could have asked for 90%, but he knew 10% was, was about right, I guess, for us, you know. And, and, and so, but that belongs to God. And if you want to give over and above that, you can give over and above that to whatever you want. But that 10%, it goes to the storehouse. It goes to God's church so that there might be food in my house so that God can, can, can feed the nations with His gospel, okay? And so, look. The way ministry happens today is that we give our tithe to the local church and then ministry happens and people come to Jesus and, and ministry spread and good things happen to the to the church. And so we're, we're wrapping this up. So hang up, hang with me just a few more minutes. Then look at these two words. He says, test me. Put me to the test. Do you see that? Back up in Malachi. Put me to the test. He's saying, test me in this. This is, this is the only time in Scripture that those two words are used in positive fashion. Most times, the Scripture says, don't test God, don't it? Don't, don't put God to the test. But God says, test me in this. And He says, see what happens. See, He says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you won't have room for it. So He says, test me in this. And so look, if you want God's blessing in your life, love God and His will enough to trust Him by giving Him the full time of everything you have. I'm going to ask you to put this test. Look, I've never met anybody who's brought the full tithe to, to God and said, you know what, that was a waste of money. Anybody know if anybody's ever said that? Nobody ever says that. That was a waste of time. Nobody, nobody ever says that because the person who brings a full tithe to the Lord will give the same testimony, God's blessing. The windows of heaven open. He says, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you, you will not have enough room for it. So, now you want to describe your life not having enough or having the floodgates open? And how, how, how do you see your life? And so, look, if you're here and you've not been tithing, I'm calling you today to test God over the next four months. And to the end of the year, bring a full tithe to God of everything you make to the end of the year and see if God don't pour out His blessing upon you. Will you do that? Now, those of you who are giving more than 10%, don't stop giving more than 10%, alright? But, but I'm, I'm, I'm challenging those who are not giving 10%. You see, only our issue with money, you know, it's not, our issue is not with the money. You know, it's really not with money. It's the issue of our heart. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, He says, wherever your treasure is, there's where your heart is. If you want a greater heart for God, then start giving your treasure back to God. And so these, what we talked about this morning are the fruits of an engaged life. And so we're talking about taking responsibility. We're talking about experiencing contentment. We're talking about giving God an hour every week and serving the church. We're talking about inviting our friends to church. And we're talking about giving the full tithe back to God. Five things. And so how are you doing in those areas? Now that's the question. How are you doing? What's the fruit of your life? Do you have all five? Are you doing all five? If not, then take some action steps today to make sure that you're not missing out on any of these actions of engagement. In Matthew chapter 7, we see here that uh, Jesus said, You will recognize them by their fruits. He says, Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So what's the fruit of your life? See, the good fruit are these five things. If I'm not doing these things, then we're talking about the bad fruit. And so, can you check them off? What's the fruit of your life? I hope you'll take this step today to be fully engaged and start bearing the good fruit that God wants you to bear, bear in your life. And so, Right now, as, as uh, they come to prepare, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond today. And, and um, I want us to bow our heads. And I, I, here's what I'm going to do today. Everybody just bow your head, close your eyes, and I'm going to say a prayer. And if this prayer represents what you want to say in your heart, then you just say, me too, God. You just, you just say, amen, and you pray this with me. So everybody bow your head, close your eyes, and let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to give, I want to live a life fully committed to you. Lord, I... I, I want to take responsibility for my growth, Lord. Every day, I just want to take responsibility, and I want to say, Lord, help me to grow today. God, help me to practice commitment in all these areas, Lord. Help me not to get so caught up in the past or so focused on the future that I don't enjoy you in the now. Lord, help me to be content in all things. Then, God, never let me forget it's not about me. It's about you, God. Make me into your servant. Make me more like your son, Jesus. Then, God, I pray pray for my friends, people in this area that I care about. Lord, help me to take advantage of the opportunities you give me to invite them to come to church with me. And, Lord, 
Finally, I want to honor you with all my finances. Lord, I want to be consistent and faithful and bring in a tithe. Make me into a fully committed person, fully engaged person with you, fully engaged with the church. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, do your work in every heart. God's speaking to your heart this morning. I want to invite you just to come. Maybe you need to 